This is a mechanism of disease map for cystic fibrosis. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of this disease. And we'll see that cystic fibrosis can manifest in many organ systems throughout the body. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color-coded according to this legend that we have at the top right, so you can follow along as I talk through the flowchart. Let's get started. At the center of the etiology for cystic fibrosis is an ATP-gated chloride channel, and we'll see how a deficit in the production of this channel can lead to manifestations where it's deposited throughout the body. Cystic fibrosis in the very beginning is a genetic disorder. It's a hereditary disorder, and it's actually a recessive disease. This means that you're predisposed to having it if your parents are heterozygous carriers for the cystic fibrosis disorder. Um, this means that if both of your parents are heterozygous carriers, their child will have a 25% chance of having cystic fibrosis. This makes sense. If a heterozygous has two alleles and one of the alleles is affected, they'll have a 50% chance of passing on that allele. If both parents have that 50% chance, then the child will have a 25% chance of receiving the affected allele from both parents. So that's how you can get it from two heterozygous parents. You can of course also have the genetic disorder through random mutations. So there's always a chance that people have cystic fibrosis if one or if zero of the parents have um, a heterozygous allele for cystic fibrosis. In any case, the most common mutation for cystic fibrosis is called Delta F508, and it's present in the CFTR gene. This gene is located on the long arm of chromosome 7, and it encodes for the CFTR protein. When you have this mutation, the Delta F508, it results in the absence of a phenylalanine in position 508. So phenylalanine is the amino acid that's um, related to this location on the CFTR gene, and when it's missing, the protein is not gonna fold properly. Now the folding of proteins is a very complex problem, but we've kind of mapped this out, this one-to-one -one mutation to amino acid, and we've realized that when the, fold, when the protein is misfolded, it gets stuck in the endoplasmic reticulum, and it's unable to be distributed throughout the body. So this mutation results in a missing phenylalanine that results in a defective protein that's retained in the rough ER, and it eventually gets degraded. So you, you're missing this ATP-gated chloride channel. And it's supposed to be on the cell surface of many epithelial cells throughout the body, but it's not there in cystic fibrosis. The end result is uh, manifestations throughout the body, as I mentioned a couple times now. And it's worth knowing that the pathophysiology differs slightly in your sweat glands versus in your GI tract, your GU tract, and your respiratory tract. So I'm going to break down the pathophysiology according to those two categories. In your sweat glands, when you're missing this chloride channel, you're no longer able to reabsorb chloride from the lumen of the sweat glands. So we'll notice that in the sweat glands, you won't have the ability to reabsorb chloride channels, and that'll also affect your ability to reabsorb sodium and reabsorb water as well. So try to link chloride to sodium and water when thinking through this pathophysiology. As I mentioned, if you can't reabsorb chloride, you'll also have a deficiency in reabsorbing sodium and water, which means that you'll have more sodium chloride lost in your sweat. Now, sodium chloride is the same as your standard table salt. So the manifestation here will be that you'll have extra salty sweat. You might even have a salty baby upon its initial presentation. This is actually a historic presentation of cystic fibrosis. Um, the classic case from hundreds of years ago even was mom would kiss baby and notice that it's, the baby tasted saltier than the other children and that's because it had salty sweat from cystic fibrosis. The baby was not able to reabsorb the chloride, the sodium, and the water, and it had excess salt loss in its sweat. In very severe cases, this can cause electrolyte wasting, but that's not very common. And one of the modern tests for cystic fibrosis also relies on this salty sweat. It's called the sweat chloride test, and if the patient has a chloride of greater than or equal to 60, then that's indicative of cystic fibrosis. So again, for the pathophysiology here, keep in mind that chloride, sodium, and H2O all kind of travel together. And in the sweat glands, you're not able to reabsorb chloride from the lumen of the sweat glands. 
The opposite is true in the GI tracts, the respiratory tracts, and the urogenital tracts. In this case, you're not able to transport intracellular chloride across the cell membrane into the lumen, so it's kind of reversed in this case. And again, chloride, sodium, and water will all be linked. So when you have decreased secretion of chloride and water, you'll have increased intracellular chloride. This means that you'll have increased sodium reabsorption. This is the channel that um, transports both sodium and chloride together. And you'll also reabsorb more water as well, and that's just through osmosis. So again, in this case, your chloride, your sodium, and your water are all being um, kept inside the cell, out of the lumen. The result in this case is that your mucus and your secretions become hyperviscous. They become extra thick and they accumulate. You're no longer able to clear mucus in a lot of these tracts throughout the body. This ends up blocking small passages throughout many of the tracts throughout your body. But one last time, I want to emphasize the difference here. In the sweat glands, you end up with too much salt in your sweat. In the other tracts of your body, you're not able to secrete the, the salt into those tracts. And that means that the water that normally would follow the salt and kind of break up this hypermucus, this hyperviscous mucus, is not there. So you end up with very thick mucus because you're not able to insert water and salt into the mucus. So it's worth knowing the differences here. In any case, now let's get to the, to the manifestations, the broad manifestations. Um, we have the GI tract, the pancreas, the liver tracts, the bile ducts, the nasal sinuses, the lungs, the urino, urogenital tract as well. So we'll go through each of these one by one and we'll see quite a lot of manifestations for cystic fibrosis. First in the GI tract, you can have a meconium ileus. This is essentially um, stool. Baby's first stool is called meconium. And when it's not able to pass through the GI tract because they have such thick secretions, such thick mucus, it's called a meconium ileus. It'll present as no meconium or stool for the first one or two days of baby's life. Baby might have abdominal distension because of course uh, baby's first feedings and everything kind of builds up behind that meconium ileus. And that might even result in bilious vomiting as well. So that's a very early presentation of cystic fibrosis. If you have thick secretions and not able to move stuff through your GI tract properly, that also causes malabsorption. You can also get malabsorption from clogging up the tracts from your pancreas. Remember that your pancreas is responsible for um, its exocrine function of many of your digestive enzymes, so that can also contribute to malabsorption. In a child who has malabsorption, they can end up with failure to thrive, they're not gaining weight appropriately. In adults, it can lead to weight loss. In all people, it can um, end up in hypoproteinemia since you're not able to you know produce the proteases put those into your GI tract to digest and absorb protein and of course your fat soluble vitamins will be affected because your pancreas is responsible for producing lipase and putting that into your intestines to help with the absorption of fats so you might be deficient in vitamin D E A and K that's DEEK for the fat soluble vitamins in addition you can have a pancreatitis this is when your digestive enzymes in the pancreas get blocked, again, because of this hyperviscous mucus. They back up and the pancreas starts to auto-digest itself. So patient might present with typical pancreatitis pain, which might be in the epigastric region, and you might have pancreatitis labs. I'm not listing them here because it'll get very busy here in a second, but you might have a high lipase, um, for instance, on your blood work, which might suggest pancreatitis in a patient that has cystic fibrosis. In addition, because you're not able to secrete lipase that helps with the digestion of fats, you can have a steatorrhea. Um, this is an oily, fatty stool that tends to float in the toilet bowl and, uh, and have a very foul odor. So if you can't absorb the fats, it makes sense that you'll be deficient in your fat-soluble vitamins, but you'll also end up with very greasy, fatty stools, steatorrhea. Of course, if you have a liver and bile duct blockage, that might also contribute to your steatorrhea. Remember that your bile ducts produce um, bile. Um, your gallbladder stores it and you secrete bile to also help in the digestion of fats. So um, any kind of bile problem also kind of leads back to that steatorrhea. Blockages in the liver and bile ducts also lead to stones in the um, liver and bile ducts and that can lead to cholestasis or essentially bile that's not moving. There are other symptoms associated with this, of course, if your liver gets backed up. We're gonna list those here. This includes jaundice, pale stools, dark urine, and pruritus as that bilirubin starts to build up in your bloodstream. 
In addition, you can have an infection and inflammation that kind of happens behind the blocked up bile tract. This can result both from the stones that might form from the static bile ducts, but also from the hyperviscous mucus and secretions that are blocking up your, your bile duct. So there's a lot of congestion going on in your biliary system. So cholangitis can lead to cirrhosis, which can cause all of these same symptoms as the liver gets backed up, but also can cause, in severe cases of cirrhosis, portal hypertension and esophageal varices. Um, this is typically a later presentation of cystic fibrosis, but it very much affects your liver and bile tracts. Next, this is a little easier. If you get hyperviscous mucus and blocked sinuses, you can end up with a chronic sinusitis. This might, this is an infection, of course, and it might present with congestion and nasal discharge that is recurring and happening again and again over time. It can also lead to the development of nasal polyps. Lungs is another big one for cystic fibrosis patients. Um, it's, it's typically the bronchioles of your lungs, but in any case, you end up with recurrent pulmonary uh, infections. So it could be bronchitis, it could be pneumonias, um, typical and atypical pneumonias. And when you have those over time, it could lead to bronchiectasis, which is like chronic mucus plugging of your, um, of your lungs, essentially. And the patient ends up with a really nasty chronic cough. They can have shortness of breath. They can be coughing up blood frequently as the inflammation um, behind the backed up mucus kind of breaks into the lung tissue. Patient might have wheezing. And because bronchiectasis is an obstructive lung disease, similar to COPD, patient can even develop a barrel chest over the time. Now these respiratory problems can make the patient hypoxic. And when you have chronic hypoxia, this can result in digital clubbing, so thickening of the fingers related to hypoxia. Um, that can also happen in cystic fibrosis. Next organ system to be affected is the urinary tract. If you have uh, thick secretions in your urinary tract, it can cause frequent UTIs, which of course present as cloudy urine and pain with urination, maybe burning with urination, dysuria. You can also have kidney stones that develop. So uh, you'll notice that stones tend to develop when things get backed up. So in the in the bile ducts, you'll have you know gallbladder stones that form um, when your biliary tract gets backed up. In the renal tracts, the same thing happens. You'll have kidney stones that form when uh, when when those get backed up. So kidney stones can of course precipitate more UTIs. They can also cause pain with urination, and they can also cause flank pain and hematuria, blood in your urine. Lastly, organ system is your genitalia that's affected. So your genitourinary tract in both men and women can lead to infertility in cystic fibrosis. Let's talk about the mechanism through which this happens. In men, the vas deferens is the tube that carries the sperm from the testicles um, through to the urethra for um, kind of transforming, trans transporting that sperm with the ejaculate. In cystic fibrosis, we have these blockages in small passages, and one of those small passages is the vas deferens. So it could be obstructed, and it might just be absent, because if it's obstructed during development, it doesn't develop properly. This results in azospermia, which means that you have low or no sperm in your, eja in your ejaculate, and that results in infertility. So that's how it happens in men. In women, you'll have extra viscous cervical mucus. Just like all the other mucuses and secretions in cystic fibrosis, the cervical mucus will be extra thick, which can result in infertility. And uh, women with cystic fibrosis can also have amenorrhea, which of course predisposes them to infertility. So I hope uh, this review is helpful. It really shows how many, all of the manifestations kind of originate from this hyperviscous mucus and secretions and how all of that happens because of this problem with this chloride channel on the cell surface of epithelial cells. I hope this review was helpful and thank you for listening.